pray together. Our great God and loving Father, how glad we are to be found in your house and to trust in you, not just for our church, for each and every one of us, but for the work that you have begun. Because Father, your work is a huge work, it's a great work, and no one person can do the work. But together, as we join hands and hearts together, we can see your power at work. So today, Lord, as we celebrate National Day in a few days' time, as we uh, know the many wonderful programs that have been lined up, not just in the nation, but in our community centres and even in our own homes, to celebrate your goodness to Singapore. Lord, you love Singapore. May your face continue to be upon us. Then nothing that we do will rob us of your grace that be sufficient. So, Lord, we pray for wisdom for the leaders to lead the nation. We know that with all these irritations, it becomes very difficult because attentions are div divided and distracted. But we pray, Lord, that you help us to focus on the main thing. And for us as Christians, the main thing is that we love our neighbours. And we ask the Lord, the neighbours that you brought into our very midst, the children, the ping-pong khakis, help us to love them, to care for them, and to be there for them. For this is our prayer. We ask it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, today we continue in this uh, chapter, in, uh, in the whole book of Ecclesiastes. But we come to a chapter that means a lot to me because somehow I do not know why, you know, I always kind of, uh, you know, being scheduled to preach on death. But you know, this is what we're going to talk about today. Death. You know, nobody likes to hear the word death. Even when you talk about someone dying, you say, oh, pass on, you know. Oh, went home. That's why when you send text messages and say someone has gone back to their house, don't say went home, you know, because, ah, went home, you know, because we try to soften those things. We try to say, oh, promoted to glory, you know, but we don't like to use the word death. But yet, when you think about the preacher, Solomon, he uses the word and he tells us about the common destiny for all of us. So let's stand as we read those verses together. Or the 18 verses in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Let us begin. So I reflected on all this and concluded that the righteous and the wise and what they do are in God's hands. But no one knows whether love or hate awaits them. All share a common destiny, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. As it is with the good, so with the sinful, as it is with those who take oaths, so with those who are afraid to take them. This is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. The same destiny overtakes all. The hearts of people, moreover, are full of evil, and there's madness in their hearts while they live, and afterward they join the dead. Anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. The living know that they will die. But the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even their name is forgotten. Their love, their hate, and their jealousy has long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. Go, eat your food with gladness, and drink your wine with a joyful heart. For God has already approved what you do. Always be clothed in white, and always anoint your head with oil. Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love, all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun, all your meaningless days. For this is your lot in life and in your toilsome labor under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the rhyme of the dead where you are going, there is neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom. I have seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favour to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. Moreover, no one knows when their hour will come. As fish are caught in a cruel net or birds are taken in a snare, so people are trapped by evil times. They fall unexpectedly upon them. I also saw... Some people of wisdom that greatly impressed me. There was once a small city with only a few people in it, and a powerful king came against it, surrounded it, and built huge siege works against it. Now they live in that city, a man poor but wise, 
and he saved the city by his wisdom. But nobody remembered that poor man. So I said, wisdom is better than strength. But the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are no longer heeded. The quiet words of the wise are more to be heeded than the shouts of a ruler of fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Thank you. Please be seated. May God bless the reading, the hearing, and most of all, the joyful obedience to His Holy Word. Sometimes you think that I'm repeating this whenever I preach, but it's true that the important thing is not just to be hearers of the Word, but be doers of the holy words of God. Because these are not the words of men. These are not the opinions of the pastors nor you know, the preachers that we invite to our church. But these are the very words of God, and we need to heed them. Now, just now I use the word death, because death is supposedly the last enemy. Most people think that, you know, death is such a fearsome thing. You know, I'm privileged to be invited to many a deathbed of, you know, not just family members, but of friends, of church members. Many a times when church members, their family are dying, they, they wanted the pastor to be there. And I'm privileged to be there. But you know, sometimes when I'm there, I see all kinds of things happening. For example, a loved one that denied the death of the father. You know, she kept screaming and shouting and crying, my father is not dead. Please don't tell me he's dead. He's alive. He is very much alive. Pastor, please tell me he's alive. You know, and so she just cling on to this hope that her father has not died. But the reality is that he is gone. Sometimes people invite me to the home because they are not sure whether the loved one has died. On a few occasions, someone say, Pastor, you know, someone's husband uh, is, they don't know whether he's dead, no? Uh, he just had a a shower, he was sitting in a chair, and then he was quiet, and then there was stillness. They are not sure. Pastor, can you please go over? So I immediately go there, and lo and behold, I'm no doctor, I'm no uh, pathologist or whatever, but I know that the person is gone. You know, and many times when I go to the hospital, and uh, sometimes it was a false alarm. Someone, in, I, I remember a very prominent person invited me, and said, Pastor, my father is dying, no? My whole family is here already. Please come. So I was there at the ICU with the whole family. 20, 30 of people were there and, you know, I was praying for them. But you know what? Next moment, the father woke up and said, what are you all doing here? Why are you here? Hey, I want to eat wonton mee, you know? Can you just go and buy for me the wonton noodle? <laughs> you know, everybody was shocked <laughs> because they thought he was going, but he wasn't. But we know death comes when everything becomes zero. Death comes when everything is zero. That's what I felt was a good definition of death, when everything is zero. When the heartbeat is no longer going like this and like this and like this, it's just straight. When there's no more brain wave, there's no more breath. That even if you put... Mao San Wang in front of the person, that person cannot respond. You know, the durian can be so strong in the smell, it does nothing. So death comes when everything is zero. No wars, everyday occurrences of death. COVID-19, when it first happened, we were all so fearful. You know, we hid in our homes. There was circuit breaker. We were so afraid to go out. You know, we were so even afraid to go and buy food. Beloved, it is an experience. Why? Because many of us are so afraid of death. Because wars, everyday occurrences, and even the pandemic reminds us of our mortality that we know that we'll soon be overtaken, but let's not allow it to overtake us now because it will shorten our plans. It will cut short all the things that we, we want to do. You know, we, we don't want to postpone those appointments. We want it to be, you know, delayed. You see, you're not prepared to die until you're prepared to leave. Beloved, you're not prepared to die until you're prepared to leave. And you're not prepared to leave until you are prepared to die. Because living and dying, they seem to be on the opposite side. 
But how you respond in your life will also depend on how you respond to death. And how you respond to death will determine how you respond to life. You know, many people think that life is an endless series of dreams. We will live forever. We will conquer every mountain. You know, we will just get waters in the wilderness and make sure they are transformed into fruitfulness. And our life is like an endless dream that will come true for us because we are young, we are strong, you know, we are swifter, we can fly higher, we can fly better, and we can fly longer. Beloved, that's how we often look at life. But when death comes, are you ready to face it? You know, I believe that let's expect the unexpected or you'll never expect it. You know, the Bible tells us that death is not an accident. I'm not talking about the accident on the road or the accident when two ships collide or two planes or the plane, you know, just dive down into the Palembang River. You know, I'm sure you remember the silk air that went straight down. Beloved, we're not talking about life. death as an accident. Death is not an accident. Death is an appointment. That's why Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it says, For it is appointed for every man once to die, and then comes the judgment. You see, the Bible says that death is not an accident. It is an appointment, a destiny that nobody but God can cancel or change. Everyone has a common destiny, but we go to different destinations. We have a common destiny. The destiny is death, but is death your ultimate destiny in life? No, death is not our ultimate destiny. Death is a common destiny, but our ultimate destination is either to live eternity together with God or eternity without God. But you see, today, as you think about this chapter, it talks about two things. It talks about the certainty of death and secondly, the uncertainties of life. When you look through the whole chapter, actually it's quite easy to divide them because one talks about the certainty of death and the other one talks about uncertainties of life. You see, the two sides of the coin but he's talking about not an accident, but an appointment. Because whether you're a Christian or you're not a Christian, whether you're a child of God or you're not a child of God, we all have one thing that we will meet at the end of life. Our Maker and our Creator. Do you know why? Because we are all eternal beings. Everyone is an eternal being. We will have to stand before the eternal God and face him right before his throne. So today, at least the living has a chance, has a hope. That's why he left the preacher. He, you know, I, I like his sense of humor. He says, better a dog that's alive than a lion that's dead. You know, the dog, to some people, oh, he's puppy. He's my favorite. He's not my pet. Some treat the dogs as if he's family. You know, sleep on the same bed and hug and kiss the dog and I tell every dog lover thinks that all dogs go to heaven. Right on. Every dog lover thinks that. Of course, every cat lover also thinks that all cat goes to heaven. In case you have not heard me talk about the dog-cat theology, hear it from me again. You see, dogs feel that because you love it, you know, you pamper it, and you spend all your time and energy with the dog, the dog thinks that you are God. But a cat is different. The cat thinks that because you love it so much, you spend a lot of time and energy, feed it and, and, and pet it and give it the best. They think they are God. You see? That's the difference between the cat and the dog. But of course, a dog or a cat is a good pet. Because children, they grow up and they rebel against us sometimes, you know? You say yes and they say no. You say no, they say yes. It's not easy. But dog, however you treat them, you know, at the end of the day, you're so tired, you're so worn out, you're just so frustrated with life. But the dog will be waiting at the door to pounce on you, to love you, to kiss you, and to lick you. Isn't it true? You see, dogs, you can treat them so badly, but they will still love you. They don't turn against you. You see, 
That's why the Bible says, better a dog that's alive than a dead lion. A lion is majestic. It's the king of the creatures. But so what? It's dead. You see, whereas a dog, to the Jewish people, the dog is unclean. It's despised. That's why there's some religious groups that do not tolerate having dogs around. They don't. Beloved, some of us treat dogs like pets, you know, we spend tens of thousands of dollars on them. But you know, there are people who despise the dogs because they think they're unclean animals. So what the preacher is saying, better a dog that is alive because it's got hope. It will hope that its owner will come back, the owner will feed it. No, last year, my wife and I were in Japan. I was preaching in Tokyo, and we went to the station where this dog, the statue of the dog was there to remember this dog. This dog is so famous all the world. You know, we saw one group of, I think, Argentinians, you know. Wow, they all were so excited to take picture of the dog, you know. They were climbing all over each other because this dog waited for 20 over years for the owner to come back. It was faithfully waiting for the owner. Thus, the word of God says, better a dog that's alive than a dead lion. Why? Because as long as there's life, there is hope. As long as there's life, you can make things different. You can make the change. Your life can be meaningful. It need not be the meaningless life that you may be experiencing. Because as long as there's life, there is hope. That's why as Christians, we have a living hope. That's what we were singing about. So beloved, what are you living for? Now that we know we all have a common destiny, but different destinations, what are you living for? So certainty of death. First point, life is in God's hands. You know, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 2 says, There's a time to be born and a time to die. There's a time for everything beautiful in the hands of God. Because God has scheduled everything according to His time. Everything according to His seasons. You know, in Singapore, we live in a country that only has one season. But you know, you go up north, you go out down south, there are four seasons. How beautiful, isn't it? But you know what? Many of us prefer the single season. Then we don't have to, you know, show over the, the, the snow. You know, I've been privileged to, to go to the West many times. And sometimes I wanted to say yes to those churches that invited me. Whether in Canada or in USA, you know. But I was thinking, my goodness, i got to wake up in the morning, and you know what? When it snows, my car will be covered with snow, and i could shove the, all the all the shows, shove all the snow before I can drive my car. Worse still, if your car is in Michigan, uh, no, in Chicago, you're parking next to the Lake Michigan. You know, um, Lake Michigan actually is a big lake that covers much of Chicago, you know? the contours of the land of Chicago. But you know, the land of Chicago is called the Windy City. The wind is so strong that the wave can come in, and next moment, your whole car is covered with ice. You cannot drive a single inch. You've got to hit your car before you can get into the car to drive it off. You see, I was thinking of those, uh, ah, Singapore better. Lah. We are a garden you know, we are actually a city in the garden. You know, gardens, you know, we always think we are a garden city, but we are actually a city in the garden, isn't it? Recently, we had a friend who came to Singapore, and she says, Singapore is not a city city, you know. Singapore is very nice, gorgeous building, but also so many trees, so many flowers, and sometimes she goes to places where there are no buildings along. She says, wow, Singapore is very big, huh? Yeah, it's true. The most beautiful country to my wife and I. This is my country. This is my home. So you say, Pastor, you copy the government. No, 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 no. Long ago, the Americans and the Canadians asked me to serve there. I say, Singapore, that's my country. That's my home. My children say, Daddy, we are here because this is our home. But you go back to Singapore just for a while. We come back here. I say, no, no, no. Singapore, that's our country. That's our home. This is where I belong. You know, I think this is a good reminder for us, isn't it? National Day. Sir, you are very obedient. You wear white and red. Good for you. Well, 
Kohilev says there's a season for everything. God even determines where we live and when we die. Why? Because we're eternal beings. So that's what makes life so sacred. Every life is special. Beloved, every child is special because we are made in the image of God. Even the fetus, the moment when, you know, the chromosomes come together, you know that it's become a baby. The fetus is already made in the image of God. That's why we believe in the sanctity of life. But you see, the second thing is that, you know, in this life is in God's hand, is that prosperity is not always a good thing. But neither are the pains, the afflictions and the atrocities of life a bad thing. Because sometimes prosperity can make us so prideful. We forgot our origin. We forgot where we came from. And that's what happens to people who become rich, powerful and significant. You know, they forgot their humble be beginnings. But thanks be to God, the pain and the afflictions can help us to turn our face to our maker and creator and acknowledge him, the sovereign of the nation, the sovereign of our lives. You know, next, life's common destiny, but different destinations. You know, I already said that, you know, death is not an accident, it's an appointment. But if it's an appointment, are you ready to meet God? Are you ready? You know, I think sometimes we need to ask ourselves those difficult questions. Because, you know, we are in the midst of living, we have dreams of oh, upgrading, you know, from a HDB to a condo, and then from a gondo, condo to a landed property, and then landed properties, and then properties beyond the shores of Singapore. You know, we have dreams of so many kinds, our future, our children, and our prosperity, many. But you know what? In the midst of making those plans, it's not wrong, but are you ready to meet your maker and your Creator. Because whether you're a Christian or you're not a Christian, you will meet the Creator one of these days. It's an appointment. So, live life in such a manner that whenever it happens, whatever happens, we are always ready to be found in His presence. Right now, in the presence of the Most High God, this is the house of God. We are ready in His presence. But the day when something happens to us, will we be find, found in His presence? Or are we so afraid that day happens and we do not know what's going to happen to us, where we are going? Beloved, life has a common destiny, but there are two destinations. Which destination you choose depends on you. Thirdly, life is tremendous. What is Kohilev talking about? Life is about living. You know, God gave us life, not to be gloomy and dull and, and so boring, you know, walking about with papaya faces that are long and so sad. But life should be so exciting because life is better than death. When death happens, there's no reward, there's no plans, there's nothing. But when you live life, you know that life is tremendous. You know, people always say, you know, we only die once. You know, yes, that's true. We actually should be dying every day to Christ and live in Him. Because the true way of living life is living it together with your Maker and your Creator. So you look at the dead. The dead have no consciousness. They know nothing. They, hope have, have, they have no hope of reward. There's no hope of enjoyment. But even their passions, their love, you know, their hate, their jealousy, they all come to nothing. You know, I find that it's so true, isn't it? That when you think of some people towards the end of their life, they may have many achievements in life, but towards the end, they say, you know, well, can't pull it. You know, I see open, <laughs> you know, so it's direct translation. Uh, well, can't pull See broken. Uh. Actually, you see open, right? You know why? Because in life, there will always be the injustice. There will always be people's criticisms or whatever. But you take them so much to heart that it controls the way you live your life. Let us return 
to the maker and the creator. He knows when to vindicate you. He knows whether your life, your motives are right and good in His eyes. So you see, the dead, they cannot return to life. They cannot do what they have missed to do. And they also cannot undo their misdeeds. That's what happens to the dead. So what is done cannot be undone. So be careful how we live our life. Life is tremendous, but live it with zeal, with zest, you know, with gusto, because there's only one life that we have. Let's live a life that really counts. Yes, one day when we go, nobody may remember us, you know, they forget our names, there's no uh, stat those statues or plaques on the wall, you know. I, I was on, on the, away on the pastor's retreat this past week. We went to the church where our friend, one of our pastors, both her grandparents were actually pastors of the church. So she showed us the stone to this grandfather and the stone to the other grandfather. I said, wow, amazing, man. You come from a very rich heritage of godly, you know, uh, ancestors. You know, the stones are there. But you know, for many of us, there are no stones made in our names. Because New Life Baptist Church is not so old until we erect those stones and say, you know, our first pastor, Elijah Leong Hao Singh, you know, from this year to that year. Second pastor, you know, uh, Reverend Sim Sui Ki, you know. Uh, third pastor is uh, Lai Sun Loy. And, you know, we, we don't have this. But you know what? It's not about all these things. It is a life that has touched other lives that counts. You know, sometimes you look for all the accolades, all the bouquets, you know, the people will sing our praises. But what is most important are the lives that you have touched. Is your life tremendous? And of course, life can be a series of celebration. You see, the preacher talks about life is a gift. Let's enjoy it because it's a gift from God. That's how you can talk about your wife. Enjoy the wife of your youth. You know, I, I'm so privileged to be at most weddings that are being conducted in this church and also some other weddings. In fact, tonight I'm conducting a wedding too. But I'm conscious of the fact that the Bible says in Proverbs 18 verse 22, he who finds a good wife finds a good thing. You no, know, he left us for eating, drinking, enjoying life. But there's only one thing that seems out of sync with the rest of what he says. Enjoy the wife of your youth. Because that is the meaningful thing to do in this life. Beloved, our husband, our wife, they are only our husband and our wife while we are still alive. There comes a time when death comes knocking at our heart's door. Yes, we are all going to the same destiny, the same destination, but no more the same date where, you know, husband and wife still hold hands. Hello, darling. We are all children of the Most High God. So let's enjoy our spouses while we are still alive. So beloved, see life together with your wife. See life with your husband. Enjoy that life. You know, whatever you're doing, enjoy your husband or your wife. But for some of you who says, Pastor, why you only talk about those who are married? How about those not married? Well, thanks be to God. To be married is a gift from God. But not to be married is also a gift from God. Except that every time wedding, those who are married are very cruel to those who are not married. Because you always say, hey, when, when is your, uh, your date? Lah? Please don't ask such questions. You know, actually, uh, sometimes those who are married wish that they are on the other side. You know, I tell you, I'm not suggesting that that is always the case. But I'm saying don't be cruel. Because to be married is a gift. Yes, some of you who are single think, wow, very good to be married. Huh? You don't know, huh? like my friend said after his wedding, wow, pastor, you say that marriage, huh? all your sorrows will be half and your joy will be doubled. What nonsense, pastor. It is wrong. It's the other way. All your burdens are double and your joys are half. I say, what do you mean? You know, huh? last time I go home, my mother already ironed all my clothes. So I just take it out and wear and go to work, no? Now I've got to put them in the wash, washing machine, take them out to dry and iron them. And then I, 
I could not only just iron for myself, but for everyone in the family, you know. Pastor, married life, uh, not burden half, a uh, burden doubled. You know, to be married is a gift. Because it's not easy to live with someone who is so different from us. I'm not talking about having problems in life. No. You know, when two people are different, that's what attracted you to each other. You know what I mean? But it's not the difference that will cause problems in the marriage. It's the similarities. When both are equally explosive, that's why there's fireworks in the house. You know what I mean? But when both are gentle and nice, you know what I mean? There's no fireworks. If one is so gentle, the other one is explosive, actually the one who is gentle will cover up the volcano. You know what I mean? So, beloved, life, Kohilev tells us, enjoy your wife. Enjoy your husband. But for those of us who are single, let's enjoy our single life. Because Jesus Christ is our husband. Jesus Christ is the one who is our constant companion. But you know what? Sometimes... It's not necessary that you be single all your life because somehow God does bring people, someone into our life. I tell you, I don't just marry those people in the 20s and 30s. Huh? I also marry people who are in the 50s. You know? And I know one church member whose father was 77 and the father married someone who was 50 years old. You know? And the mother, not mother, the father's new wife is older, younger than him. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not suggesting that this will happen to everybody. But I want us to look at life in its proper perspective. To be married is a gift from God, and not to be married is also a gift from God. So enjoy it. So enjoy intimacy with your husband, with your wife. Oh, enjoy intimacy with Jesus Christ, un undivided, full attention, devotion. So secondly, not just enjoy what you have, you've been blessed with, enjoy your work and do your best. You know, Kohilev says, whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. Let's put in excellence. But the problem with most of us is when it comes to enjoyment, we are maximalists. But when it comes to work, we are minimalists. You know, we want to put in the least amount of energy in the work. But when it comes to enjoyment, our world, we must eat the best food. Our must be Singapore best food, the green best food kind of a branding, you know. Then you can, you know, you go and attend to that. The store, isn't it? I mean, I'm amazed. It's nothing wrong. Because we can Google and find the best place to have this drink or their food or whatever. But everything is wrong when we do not give the same amount of attention and devotion to whatever we're doing. So let's be maximalist, not just to our enjoyments, but also to our work. That's what is very important, isn't it? Let's give of our best. Let's be passionate about our work. Give of our best. And when you do that, you'll discover that your work can be your enjoyment. That's so beautiful just to be involved in your work because you can look at your work as a dane, you know, a burden, or you can work, look at your work as a blessing. You know, such a blessing to do this because you know that it's different. Nobody can do what you are doing. Even though you may be doing the same thing because you can do it differently with the passion that God gives to you. But you know, Singaporeans, we are all great complainers. We are always grumbling. You know, everything not moving. Oh, government no good, you know. I mean, in England, uh, the, the train doesn't move for two days. Nobody says anything. <laughs> Singapore, the train, 10 minutes late, only, wow, hot line. Uh, I jam out the line. And, uh, wow, government no good. Uh, vote down the government. Uh, change transport minister, you know. I mean, we are such great complainers. But beloved, look at life. Everybody tries to give of their best. You don't have to be better than the other person. Even though that person who is better than you can inspire you and challenge you to stretch your limits, you don't have to be better than the other person. You just have to be better than yourself. That's what it should be, isn't it? You know, in life, 
We, we are jealous of other people, envious of other people. Let's be the number one us than the number two, the other person. Because we try to, you know, usurp the other person's position. You know, when you do that, the person can be your idol. The person can be someone that can bring about destruction to you. But when you strive to be the best person that you can be, that's what God wants you to be. God wants you to reach your maximum capacity as His child. So, uncertainties of life, life happens when you're making other plans. You know, what is the preacher talking about? You know, I got this phrase from a show. It is called, While You Were Sleeping. You know, the show was by this, uh, I think, San Sandra Bullock, right? She was an operator at the MRT station, collecting coins, giving ticket, you know, collecting coins, entrance, press the button. Then she saw this gorgeous-looking guy. You know, wow, she likes him very much. But one day, one day, this guy got an accident, and she was so concerned, you know, because that is her idol. But you know, life happens, you know, when you're making other plans. What do I mean? Later on through the show, I'm not here to tell about the show, okay? You go and watch it yourself, you like, while you were sleeping. By the end, she didn't marry the guy. She married the guy's brother, who's a much more loving, kind, great guy, Bill Pullman, you know? I tell you, beloved, sometimes life happens when you're making other plans. What do I mean by that? What does Kohilev mean by that? Kohilev says the race is not always to the swift, to the strong, to the subtle, or to those who are smart and those who are skillful. Of course, he didn't use those words. He used the words swift, you know, uh, strong, wise, and also the word brilliant. And the last word he used was learned. But I want you to remember the five things that he talks about. The race is not always to the swift, you know, or the speedy one, speedy Gonzalez. Or to those who are strong, to those who are subtle. That means you can think. The Bible says, be subtle like a snake, and yet at the same time, be gentle like a dove. Because he's talking about wisdom, you know, and to be smart. And also to be, you know, learning. You are so learned. Yes, but the race is not always to this. Because misfortune do happen. How many times are children now when they're growing up, they're in the gifted school, you know? Wow, you have great plans and, you know, ideas for them, you know? You think that one day they'll be the lawyer, the doctor, the inventor, you know? Or the great politician. In Singapore, nobody wants a child to be a politician. But thank God, we already have good politicians, you know? But I'm telling you, of course, not all. Huh? But I'm trying to tell you this. Even though you may have everything going for you, misfortune can also happen. Suddenly an illness, suddenly a distraction, suddenly the uh, bankruptcy or whatever, and all the plans dive down. Misfortune can always come anytime. So not all the wise, quick, strong always comes in first. So I have the best deals. Not necessary, but beloved, whether we have the best deals or we don't have the best deals, let us give our best and know that God loves us just as we are. You know, opportunities don't always come to the right person. Sometimes it may go to another person. So Kohilev gave you a story of how this king was so strong and powerful, amassing his army, ready to siege this small little city. But comes a, a, a poor man. You know, nobody pays attention to him. But he was very wise. And through his wisdom, he won the war over this strong king. And the city was saved and delivered. But you know what? Nobody remembers that poor but wise person. But yet, Kohilev says, wisdom is still king. Wisdom, not money, is power. Because wisdom destroys cities. Wisdom is stronger than even the strongest people. What Kohilev is telling us about is that of the uncertainties of life. Because the misfortunes can come suddenly, unexpectedly, just like, you know, the fishers being caught in the cruel nets 
all the birds being trapped. He says, suddenly these things come. No one knows when, but it happens. Sometimes it happens so fast and furious, we do not know how to respond to it. So the last point in this expose that he was given to us is life's ills and how to deal with them. You know, many people, including Christians, uh, they always say, good luck to you. When I hear it, uh, I don't feel very good. That shows that your theology is not very good. Or your faith in God uh, is not very strong. You know, we don't believe in luck. Christians, we don't believe in luck. We don't believe in chance. We believe in the sovereign control of God. That's why Kohilev started by saying, the righteous and the wise, they are in God's hands. The righteous are those who have a right relationship of, with God and does the right things. So you are in God's hands. So you see, we don't believe in luck. You know, sometimes we Christians may be ignorant. That's why we say good luck, you know. When you leave your friend, they, say, they always say good luck, you know. And I know that some other friends in other countries, they also like to use the word good luck. But when you place your hands in God, you know that God will take care of your life. Yes, there may be a little folly that can turn things around, you know. And sometimes the very good things you have done, people would forget easily. Your greatest achievements, your greatest deeds to them, they may even push it aside. And in life, it's like that. You can put in so much time and effort, but over one little mistake you make, you have to go. People don't remember all the good things you've done anymore. Beloved, that's the misfortune that Kohilev is talking about. The uncertainties of life. And all of us suffer from that. Some say, no la, pastor, I haven't. Uh, my life very good, very plain sailing. Everything is good for me. Well, God bless your heart. God bless your heart. Because for the one foolish mistake, all the good deeds we have done is being wiped out. That's why there's a phrase that says, the good I do, no one remembers, and the bad I, I do, no one forgets. No one forgets. So please remember, God never forgets. God will reward you in His own time. So recognize God's sovereignty in your hand. So in conclusion, what can we say? Lessons that we can learn from this chapter. First thing is, take death seriously, but don't fear it. You know, this book, <clears throat> Ernest Becker wrote, The Denial of Death. He said that of all things that move man, one of the principal ones is his terror of death. How true. We are all so afraid of death. But death is not just an abstract idea. God, no, death is not just a faraway reality. Death is very real. It can happen to anyone, anytime, anywhere. But let us not be phobic about death, but be ready to face death. So, take death seriously, but don't fear it. Secondly, fear God and nothing else. You know, we are eternal beings. So let's live as eternal beings. We have eternity set in our hearts. It's a matter of where you're going to live your eternity because there are two destinations. Either life with God or life without God. Two destinations. So let's live as eternal beings. Eternal beings live with fear of the eternal God because you put the eternal God right where He belongs in your life. Fearing God is ultimately the main thing in life because when you fear God, you fear nothing else. But when you do not fear God, you fear everything. Beloved, let's learn to fear God because to fear God is to put Him right where He belongs. And fearing God means keeping His commandments. That means obeying Him in His Word. That's why whenever I preach, I say, you know, the joyful obedience to His Holy Word. Living out His Word in your life. That shows that you fear God. But when you're not living out God's Word, then it shows who you really are. And of course, finally, life is uncertain. Death is certain. But only God is the constant and the center. You know, God is the constant and God is the center. So let's lean on God. Not lean on our knowledge, lean, lean on our skills, our abilities, our talents, our brilliance, you know, and everything that we can have. Swift, strong, longer, faster, better. Finally, live life to the fullest. 
You know, living for Jesus, that's what the Apostle Paul says. Well, to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. You know, let's know God and make Him known. That will be our eternal motto in life. Let's live our life to the fullest. Take time to live. Not fill our schedule with so many plans, with so many distractions, and we have no time for God, no time to rest our bodies, no time to enjoy our family, or to smell the flowers that God has given to us. That's why Kohilev says, enjoy your food, enjoy your drink, enjoy the wife of your youth, enjoy the very things that God has given to you. You see, life holds no lasting pleasures. So let us enjoy even the fleeting pleasures that God has blessed us with. You know, the greatest pleasure in your presence are joy and pleasure forevermore. You know, the two J's I find are most important in life, joy and judge. Let's enjoy our life, but let's remember there's a judge at the end of it. God will bring to account everything we have done or have not done. So, beloved, these two J's, you know that when you have the first J, you enjoy the life that God has blessed you with. Then the day when you stand before the judge, you will not be anxious or worried or stressed because you are so afraid that when death comes or Jesus comes, you are not ready. So are you ready? Finally, you know, as you think about living our life to the full, God gave us a life not only to live to the full, but to help others to live to the full. You see, God has given us two hands, one to help ourselves and the other one to help others. You know, that's the beauty of what evangelism is about. Not only are we saved in the boat that Jesus has called us into, but our hands are stretching out to lift up those who are still drowning far away from salvation, that they too are be found in this boat with Jesus, the captain of our souls. So Christians, we have both eternal life, but also abundant life. You see, that's the difference. Everyone has eternal life. It's a matter of where you live eternal life. This eternal life I'm talking about is not the other one that we mostly preach about. Eternal life is this, that you believe in Jesus Christ, whom God sent. Yes, that's good. Because everyone who is a created being has a soul, a spirit. We are eternal beings. We are. But it's a question of where we live eternal life. We already have, we are these eternal beings, but as Christians, we are the abundant life, a life in Christ. Let us share the life to others. So, you know, when by faith we claim our eternal future in Christ, what a new and different perspective that will be. We will have in life when love emerges and challenges our complacency and inwardness and makes us fiercely intent on doing good to others. So, you know, our church has already provided many opportunities, whether it's through the urban farming or helping the vulnerables in society, or the ping-pong khakis, or the homework supervision, or other evangelistic things that we are emerging, uh, emerging out to do, especially with Tai Hua Guang, you know, that elderly place just across the street. Beloved, God has given us this chance, but living for Jesus is what counts. When you live for Jesus, you know that you're living not only your relationship with Him, but to help others. Because God gives us two hands. One to help ourselves, the other one is to help others. Let us pray.